the whole world is available and we have to start thinking that way because the students are going to be working in that kind of environment, right? You don't sit with 40 other people or 30 other people to get your work done. You are at home or you are doing multi, you know, different tools and you're accessing different things. And, and we are so behind in teaching um, our young people those skills we are still teaching, we're still working in that old, you know, model of you come in, you sit down, you do what you're told. And, and now that we're realizing, no, learning is really dynamic and it is, uh, you have to be engaged and interactive and you have to have grit and perseverance and you have to think outside the box. And I think as we are preparing young people for the business world, we have to kind of mimic what's happening and we're not. Here at The Practical Optimist, we're doing something very different. Rather than focusing on celebrities or leaders who are constantly in the public eye, we want to shine a light on the incredible leaders that live next door. And today's guest is a perfect example. Nancy Barretz, who literally lives down the street from me, has been a middle school Spanish teacher for over 20 years. As a first generation Cuban American who grew up speaking Spanish with her three sisters, Nancy's going to pull back the curtain on what it's like to teach in America today. She'll also get very real talking about how she navigated COVID as a teacher and what she thinks needs to change in today's education system. As a mother of four boys, Nancy is not only a leader in the classroom, but she's a pillar in her community and her family as well. I'm your host, Ken Schmidt, founder and CEO of Turning Point Executive Search and author of The Practical Optimist. It's time to take out your number two pencils and clean off those digital whiteboards as Nancy Barretts takes us through the intersection of education, leadership, and life. Nancy, thanks so much for being with us today. I'm super excited to have a, a really cool conversation about uh, your life, your world in the classroom, and as well as being uh, the mom of four boys and the spouse of an entrepreneur. We have a lot of really cool stuff to talk about today. So thank you for joining the podcast. And thank you for having me. I'm excited to have a good conversation. Yeah, exactly. I know our, our listeners can't see this, but as I'm talking to you, I'm looking at all the really, really cool stuff behind you in your classroom there at Bernardo Heights uh, Middle School with everything, everything in Spanish, only a tiny bit of which do I actually uh, understand <laughs> from my oh, that's okay. from my early Spanish uh, back in middle school and high school, but it's been a long time for me. That's okay. A lot of people say they can't remember stuff, which is a goal of mine to change that. So people say, I remember so much. I love it. Well, I think for me, I, I probably remembered more from the Spanish that I learned working at my dad's Jack in the Box in Cardiff as a teenager than I did from just my you know freshman year, you know Spanish uh, high school class. So, um, so having that kind of that that immersion, if you will, the the unplanned immersion by working at the Jack in the Box helped me out quite a bit to retain a little bit more that I might otherwise have done. It's true, like survival, right? So if you have to use it. And it, it's like your brain just says, I guess he really needs that information and it'll stick. So. Exactly, exactly. Plus, they don't really teach you how to say, you know, put the French fries in the fryer or make some more tacos or, you know, there's somebody right. at the front waiting to be ha have their order taken. You don't really see that stuff in the uh, textbooks. <laughs> nope, you do not. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about your your role out there. So you've been a teacher for a while, um, for a number of years, and at that school also. So what? I, I guess the first thing I would ask is, you know, what what got you excited about being a teacher in the first place? I knew I was going to be a teacher from an early age, and I I would pass out papers onto my bed and protect to pretend to collect them and grade them with magic red pens. And I actually would use paper and pretend that there was like stuff on them. Um, but I just knew I always wanted to work with with kids, with young people. Um, and over time, it really was clear that I was drawn to middle school. It's a really difficult but important time in their lives. And I feel like now I'm perpetually in middle school. <laughs> but but I really like this age group. They're they're going through a lot. People say it's a difficult age group, but but I really enjoy their energy and their they're still children at some level. So I kind of like uh, being able to draw on that. Yeah, I, I know. Just to, just you know, seeing the middle schools here and just remembering my my own experience, you know, mm -hmm. the maturity level and intelligence and everything from a sixth grader, right, who's kind of what eleven years old. You know, 11, 12 years old to to an eighth grader who's kind of 13, 
13 ish. I mean, that's only a few years difference in, in numbers, but it's a huge difference in terms of maturity. A huge difference. Even during the summer, we'll see that they have changed so much from the spring to the fall. And sometimes, of course, you'll even see big differences at the same age. So you'll see a 13 year old student who is much more mature than than a peer, even though they're the same age. That had a lot to do with where they fall in their, you know, siblings and their just their family dynamics. You know, it's people develop at different stages. So it's it's interesting to see how how different it can be from child to child. Yeah, exactly. Well, and that's that's honestly that's one of the reasons I wanted I, I wanted to. And I was so excited to have you on the podcast too. Is that you know the the podcast is all about the intersection of leadership and life, and it's not just about you know people that are running a business that kind of leadership. It's also folks that are running families or that are like yourself a leader in the classroom or you know there's a, a such a wide variety of definitions for what a leader is today, right? And no matter where you happen to be, whether you're an employee or a business owner or a consultant, it doesn't make a difference. Um, you know, you can be a leader in your own right, just by virtue of being more aware and being more, more, um, I think kind of, kind of cognizant of what's happening around you and wanting to bring people together and, and help find a common ground. Mm-hmm. I think it's interesting because a teacher leader is really a term that's used often. There is no way for a teacher to advance in their career other than going into administration which a lot of teachers have chosen their career because they want to work with the young people. And so moving into an administrative position removes them from the classroom, which is a completely different career than most teachers set out to, you know, choosing. I I think what, I think would surprise a lot of people is how many opportunities there are for teacher leaders, especially at the middle school level, because at the middle school, although we um, have departments and teams, we really look at the whole child and, and we have to work together to meet so many of their needs that we can't just function as a content team. So if I were to teach at a high school, I would be with my world language colleagues most of the time. But as a middle school teacher, I spend a lot of my time talking across the content areas to find out how students are doing in different content areas. And I think that's that's one of the things I love about middle school is that we have teachers have a role in the whole child rather than just in their content. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Um, I will often meet with counselors and administration and school psychologists and other grade level teachers to talk about a student and how they're growing or progressing. And that I don't think that's something that you may do at at, a secondary level at the high school level. Oh, wow. Gotcha. Gotcha. And and you grew up in a family where your I know your your parents came from Cuba, correct? Mm -hmm. Um, but you were but you were born here in the U.S. But and I think you had told me in the past that your 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 maybe both parents had been trained as teachers, but didn't teach here in in the in the states. Correct? Yeah, both of them went to a normal school, which is what they used to call teaching school. Um, in Cuba, it was called normal school, and it was a continuation of like secondary school, kind of like a career training type of program. Yeah. So they both uh, wanted to be teachers, but the revolution kind of interfered with that. Right. It kind of got in the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> kind of got in the way of that. <laughs> yeah. Now, and as far as them coming over to the States, then did they, when they got here, did they want to get into teaching and it just didn't work out or did they decide that, you know, as a, it was better off, you know, going with a whole different career once they arrived? There really weren't uh, avenues, no pathways for that. Uh, they, they would have had to have gone back to more traditional four-year college at that point um, because this, like I said, was more of an extension of high school, more like a training program. So they didn't give them any units or credits towards that. So my, they both would have had to have started from scratch. So it was way oh, too yeah. much to be with children and no money. And so my dad... Uh, got a business opportunity and started with that and ended up with 
nine restaurants in the Northern Virginia area with some partners and raised four girls and got us all through college. So it's pretty cool American dream story, actually. That's pretty amazing. Wow. And we one more thing we have in common with my dad being a Jack in a Box franchisee and your dad being in the restaurant ah, industry as well. It's, it's pretty cool. Go. Of course, I, did, I didn't grow up in a, in a family that was quite as international as, as yours was, but um, but that's good. Did, did you grow up actually speaking Spanish and English? So in the home, we spoke mostly Spanish. And then as we went to school, we would learn English. Um, and then uh, so then we would switch back and forth at home. But at home, it was a lot of Spanish. And is that is that what drove your des- your desire, your decision to to teach Spanish of all of all subjects in school also? I think so. I mean, I when I went to high school and I got into the Spanish room, it just felt so comfortable. And it was a, one place where I really felt like it. Uh, I belonged, you know, I, I, I wasn't, you know, your straight A student. And yet when I walked into that class, people were happy and joyful and uh, learning a new skill. And I felt like I was, could be good at it. Um, And then we did some traveling. We went to Spain my junior year. And after much cajoling, my parents let, let me go on that trip. And it was just such a great, op- I, I just remember thinking, this is it. This is what I'm meant to be and meant to be doing. And um, yeah, it was just an easy, easy entryway into education. Uh, I get to teach, I get to teach history and language and grammar and <laughs> so many things, art, so many things within the world language classroom. So it's, uh, it gives me great excuses to talk about lots of things. <laughs> That's a great point. I actually never thought about it that way. But when you're teaching another language, you're, you you have to teach you know, little bits of every other subject as well, because it's mm-hmm. all wrapped up into the language that you're trying to showcase and, and impart on these kids. Right. Yeah, you have to. I mean, you can't teach language without really showing a respect for the culture. And part of that is, of course, showing a respect for the art and the literature literature, um, getting to know the geography, which a lot of Americans aren't good at, and just really introducing them to the world of Spanish speakers. Um, I always say it's impossible for me to really show you each country. Like I'm not from Uruguay, I'm not from Paraguay, but I can tell you some basics about what it was like for me to grow up as Cuban but I would have to personally go experience Paraguayan culture to really be able to, to teach about Paraguayan culture. Does that make sense? Like I'm not an expert on every Spanish speaking country, nor do I pretend to be representative of every Spanish speaking country. And a lot of what we teach and learn as culture is often the superficial stuff, you know, the holidays, the celebrations, the food, but there are a lot of things about perspectives like, um, the role of women, education, all of those things that are really more deeper culture that are really hard to teach. And really, you need to travel to to understand and, and really feel like you know a culture well. So. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the things I, I wish I had done in my college years is, um, you know, was travel and do some at least a semester abroad, which I didn't have a chance to do. I was working, living, living at home and going to college. But um, I do feel like, you know, I, I got to start traveling later in life. But, you know, I wish I had that, at least that exposure, like you're talking about, to what is it like in a different culture, in a different environment. And you see and hear about things through movies and, and whatnot. But until you're actually there and, 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 and seeing how things go, seeing how the other populations, you know, articulate themselves, how they, how they operate right in their own communities, uh, you really miss out on it unless you see it firsthand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wish I had done more of it. I mean, I felt like I was living it in a way, right, in my house. I was kind of living in a little micro culture. Um, so I didn't really get a chance to travel much. And then once I went to Spain, it really was like, wow, this is, this is great. But yeah, I really encourage my students to travel so they can really understand and get to know a culture at a, on a deeper level. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Being kind of that proverbial uh, citizen of the world, as they say. But I also think with, you know, with social media and everything else these days, everything is, you know, there's less uh, kind of 
face-to-face -face human interaction out there than there used to be. Uh, and it's just so easy to, to get this you know, impression of somebody else based on what you see in social media or wherever it might be. But, you know, and, and you forget the fact that they're they're people, they're still people, they may have different views than you politically or otherwise, but, you know, and if you don't interact with them as people, it's, it's easier, right, to kind of separate them from where you are and say kind of us versus them. Whereas if you meet more people from more cultures from around the world, you know, you realize that, you know, 80% of what we, who we are is the same, no matter where we happen to live, you know? So true. If we just slow down and take the time to get to know someone, we're so used to these quick little 15 second snippets or whatever they're called, Snapchats and videos and TikToks. And <laughs> we don't really ever get to sit down and go slow and get to know someone. And I think it's so important. And now a short word from our sponsor. We've all heard about the great resignation, the great reshuffle, quiet quitting, quiet hiring, and not to mention whatever new catchphrase the media is thinking up as we speak. But at the end of the day, in good times and bad, finding and hiring great talent is hard, plain and simple. If you find yourself frustrated with the recruiting process, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at Turning Point Executive Search. While we aren't miracle workers, I guarantee we'll make your life better by working together with you to find top performers that don't have the time to look at your job post. Our clients come to us to get access to great talent that will drive their business to the next level. And now back to our show. And I'm curious, do you think that, I mean, the way you described it earlier about, you know, some people go into teaching and then they, their, their path goes into more administration. Do you feel like that's changed over the years? Do you see more teachers coming in who say early on that their goal is to go into administration and, and not stay in the classroom? Is that, is that, have you seen that change at all? I think there's definitely people who come into teaching uh, wanting to, planning on moving into administration. For me, I think administration is such a different job that you almost have to know that that's what you want to do going in. If you really are passionate about teaching and instruction, then administration may not be a good fit for you. But if you know you want to go into that path, then you have to start in the classroom regardless. So unless you were a counselor first or something like that. Um, but I think most people kind of know what they want to do. Um, I've seen some younger teachers say, hey, I think I'm going to try to get my admin credential now and, and work my way up. And I think it's always good to have that. Um, I got my admin credential through San Diego um, County of Ed. Uh, they have a, a program there. And I went through that right before COVID. Um, and was thinking, maybe I'll go into administration, but my passion really is in the classroom. And I'm trying to find leadership roles outside of administration or traditional administration roles. So I think that's more, you know, m my passion, my interest. So working with new teachers, things like that. Right, exactly. Well, I know I, I want to come back to COVID in a minute because that's a big part of what I know we want to talk about. But um, I know we were we were getting to get we got we got together recently, and you were talking about kind of this this loose idea that you have for writing a, a book, right? Where kind of the we were joking about trying to find some alliteration to come up with a good title, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of the ten the, the the ten tenets of teaching. Ten tenets. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I was I found that fascinating because you were saying and we were the dinner that we had together was also with another teacher who teaches at the high school level. Mm -hmm. And both of you were saying, which I found interesting, that there's no kind of basic manual or basic, you know, literally tenets, right, of teaching for new teachers coming in. They get they get, you know, um, schooled, no, no pun intended, so mm -hmm. much information about kind of the, the process, right, and the, the theory and everything else. But just the basics of how do you operate as a new teacher? How do you build a network? All these different things. Maybe you can expand on that, and and maybe the if you have a sense for why that that's that's missing. It seems so basic to me. I think when you're in school, at least for me, and I I can't speak for newer graduates, but more recent graduates. But I know we spend a lot of time on theory and things like this and methodology. But the nitty gritty of teaching is a lot of systems and routines, right? And I know in business you hear a lot about systems, and I I know. For me, I would spend hours like trying to figure out how do I how do I want my students to come into the classroom? What are my rules? What are my systems? What are my procedures? Because it's so important for classroom management um, for them to have a sense of order and expectations and consistency. And those are things that are very personal. I think you have to be able to do them consistently um, and that students have to be have to 
they, they need to know that those things are going to happen. Um, the minute that you stop doing them, it kind of falls apart. So you can't start a lot of things if you don't intend on following through with them. Even if you start to feel uncomfortable with it, you need to keep doing it um, because the students need that sense of order. Um, sure. But um, I think that a lot of teachers come in and they have, they know the teaching stuff. They know what they're teaching. They know their content. Um, but the because we have, in, at least in California, so many students in our classrooms, a lot of what we do is manage people, right? Manage procedures and how we're going to communicate with our students, how we communicate with our parents, um, how are we going to notify the students, how are we going to remind them of homework, are we going to use our LSS system, are we going to use whiteboards, are we going to have them write in their planners, all those little things that we do as a, that we get used to after year after year of teaching takes a long time to develop and takes practice. Um, so the book that I was talking about with with uh, the other night was specific to world language teachers because the I think it's true with with many subjects, but at least in world language, the research and the pedagogy has changed significantly. And whereas we know what the theory and the research is, we don't know necessarily how to put it into practice. So teachers are always asking, well, how do I do that? What does the day look like? What does the lesson look like? Um, and I think that's probably true across content areas is, all right, now I have this degree and now I'm a teacher. What does my lesson planning look like? And when you're in a teacher prep program, they often will have you do very detailed lesson plans with your standard and your objectives and what you think the children will do by the end of that period and how will you know. And But it's very um, unrealistic to think that for you will do that kind of lesson planning for the rest of your career <laughs> uh, it's not realistic it, it's uh it's very unrealistic to think that you can do that level of planning for so much time and when you're actually in front of students um it's completely different and when you're student teaching you have a lot of eyes on you and a lot of support hopefully and people that you can dialogue with and say, oh, this is what I'm planning on teaching. And this is what I hope will happen. And what I expect the students to be able to come away with. And then you have someone there to talk about and say, okay, well, how do you think it went? And, oh, I, I think if you had done this and maybe tweak this part of the lesson, or maybe if you'd done another example, I mean, there's so many con ways that kind of. Yeah, sure. Sure. Right. Well, I'm sure. I mean, with, I mean, every year is, is, different to a certain extent like you said you get into a routine and you have certain things that you do the same but also the students change and you have to probably adjust and and reflect that particular makeup of that particular class you know from year to year but the, we're doing this recording now in february of 2023 right the last three years has just been completely complete up, upheaval right no matter what industry that you're in but probably no industry more so than teaching just thrown out the window literally everybody goes home no one knows when that's going to end it's going to end different times in different districts and different schools and you know parents get upset because their kids are not in school other parents get upset because their kids are being asked to go back to school you know, mask i mean there's so many things that could be probably a three-hour podcast by itself yeah. but so how i guess my my broad question is how did you get through that what what kept you going through that was it networking and connecting with other teachers and everybody a commiserating but b kind of planning together how did you how did you navigate the last three years i can't i can't even imagine well so when we first got sent home what was that february yeah Mar kind of march of of 2020 or something like that yeah okay. i immediately the students were like at first excited right we all were we didn't really yeah, know hey, what two, was happening two, yeah Two weeks yeah. working from home. How how bad yeah. can this be? <laughs> yeah. And we didn't know Zoom yet. And no one had figured any of that out yet. We had Google Meet, right? And um, I was like, gosh, I have got to see my students. Like, I just want to check in on them. So I remember I figured out how to do Google Meet uh, randomly during the day, during those early days when we didn't have any school. And I let my students know, I'm like, oh my gosh, I figured this out. Whoever's on, jump on right now. And we, and a few students came on and we were so relieved to see each other. 
I'm like, isn't this weird? So I think the students really are what kept me going, knowing that they were out there going through so much emotionally and knowing that that it was stressful, that everyone was worried about what was going to happen. Jobs were on the line, of course, health issues. And I just knew that being together as a as a class with your seeing familiar faces would be uh, kind of anchor some students and didn't matter really what we were doing, uh, but just being in that space, albeit virtually, um, really kind of provided us with some connect form of connection that the students really needed. And so that made me go down the whole wormhole of, well, how do you teach online? And I spent that whole summer just connecting. Poway did a great uh, job of trying to help us to get some training and offer things for us um, as best as they could. I think we were all trying to figure it out. But um, so I worked a lot with other teachers that were also trying to figure out how to what the best practices were for online um, and how to meet the students needs in that in a time when nobody really knew what to expect. Um, so it was I think it was really one of for me professionally, it was so challenging, but it was so rewarding to see my colleagues and to see teachers around the world uh, just coming together and doing what needed to be done. And um, I just felt so proud of my profession and of my colleagues because we were being asked thing to do things that we never would have expected. And many people, you know, that were close to retirement were like, I had never, I thought I would never have to turn on my computer or, or do these kinds of things. And now you had to, and teachers just did it. Like we just made it happen. And I just think it's amazing that on any given day, you could have hopped online and seen teachers doing their best mm -hmm. with children all over. It was just amazing. It was just amazing. Yeah, bring bring everybody together from that perspective, and 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 in the early going, especially where we were all trying to figure things out together. There was there was no precedent. There was no well. Last time we had a global pandemic, we did this right. Uh, right. We're all just literally learning as we went for for every profession, myself included. Recruiting just kind of fell off a cliff. Nobody was hiring, obviously, through the the the, the middle you know uh, middle summer and late summer of 2020, and we had no idea was it going to come back? Was it not? How do we figure this out? What I, I had many many a night where I said, okay, if I if this if this recruiting world goes away, right, what would I do instead? What's my next career choice going right. to be if not recruiting? I think we all had those thoughts. Or okay, how much? What kind of a penalty will I pay if I empty my my four hundred one k? Yes. Oh, we were business. all adding no, up I, like, yeah. wait, here's five cents and here's exactly five. right, right. What what can I save money on and what what? Yeah, it was just it was just such a crazy time. So yeah. so that was twenty twenty, and then obviously you didn't, you stayed remote for you know first semester of twenty of of the next year next school year the the end of twenty twenty. How did it go then through twenty twenty one? Where that, that's where in my recollection that's where a lot of the the pushback and uncertainty and different different counties in the same state, different states from state to state had different approaches and, and timelines for bringing students back. How did you get through that next phase? I mean, it was you you really had to like have some perseverance and some just you had to kind of roll with it because I I feel like now in hindsight, right? It's easy now in hindsight that I spent so many nights worrying about what could happen and what might happen. And I should have just let whatever happen <laughs> and then um, rolled with it. Because I think sure, as educators, we were all, what if this, what if this, what if that? And I, I think we should have given it the time that it, because eventually it, it worked out, right? It didn't work out, but eventually you got through it we rolled along yeah. and we got through it yeah there was so much anticipating i think it's normal human behavior right to anticipate what might happen but we tried to plan for every scenario and it became overwhelming and i think a lot of us just felt like it was just such a huge undertaking and i think we should have given us given ourselves a little bit of breathing room and said we don't have to solve for every scenario Right, That's right. What happens, and yeah. then you know, 
go with it. We all wanted to be ahead of it, right? We all wanted to get ahead of whatever was coming, but it, it's uh, it really was just creating more stress than, than we should have put on ourselves. Yeah, no exactly. one knew. I mean, yeah, no, really no, right. Yeah, what are you what are you planning for? I mean, that's as human nature is we want to control things as much as possible, right? right? No matter what aspect of the economy or business or any or even family from that matter. Right. Right? What what can I what can I expect? How do I plan for that? How do I, you know, head off head off at the curb any potential, you know, pitfalls or or downfalls, right? Um, we all want that for ourselves. And so it's it's tough to do when there's so many things that are completely out of our control. Out of our control. Yeah. And I felt like the students the children, like how hard it must have been for them because the adults always have the answers and are supposed to have the answers. And we had no answers. And we would, even if we tried to come up with an answer, you know, how many times did we have to pivot, as they said, you know, over and over? And uh, we, it must have been so frightening, especially for younger children, to see that the parents didn't have the answers and to see the parents being stressed. And so, I felt like as a teacher, I was, it was so uh, m mentally and emotionally helpful if the students had a calm face and someone who's like, okay, we're going to do some, you know, we're going to learn and we're going to do some stuff and some normal kind of procedures or routines or whatever. Um and to acknowledge, you know, that this is difficult and not try to have answers. You know, I think that was, I think that was in some ways was um, helpful. Like sure. yeah, I agree. a sense of calm, you know, like, okay, we're just, we're going to go to school and we're going to do it this way. And now we're going to do it this way. And as long as I wasn't panicking, they were good. Okay. This is how we're rolling. Yeah, they, took, they took their cues from you. Definitely. And, and, and even to the point of, 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 them seeing an adult say, you know what, I, I don't know exactly how it's going to go. I'm not sure what's going to be the, the situation a month from now. But for right now, to your point, let's let's kind of stay in the moment, right? Let's kind of just right. give it time to unfold the way it's going to unfold. Um, but for right now, we're going to do this. And maybe them seeing that calmness and that, that you know, um, uh, your ability to kind of give up some of that control, but be okay with it. They're going to take their cues from the from you also. So I know. So I know our, our our my youngest and your youngest are basically the same age, right? So when when this all hit, they were you know my youngest and yours were seniors in high school, and yeah. they missed that last year, which was just you know again as a parent you think oh they missed the the prom and all these different things got to do. But so I'm curious how to as as the mother of four boys, right? Mm -hmm. With yeah. your youngest now what 21 almost 21. Um, how did you guys? How did you and, and your husband Chuck? How did you navigate that as an as a family internally? What kind of discussions do you recall having around that issue of control and seeing just letting things unfold as they may? So it was interesting because we we continually had the conversation: let's control what we can and let go of what we can't. So we knew what the risks were or what were we were being told what we believe to be the risks right and so it's like okay these are the things that are in control you know they say stay inside at first you know stay inside or uh don't mix with other families all that stuff and so we would just do like this is this is what we can control but inside the house we can play our games and we can stay together as a family and we can hang out and we can cook and we can learn new things and and just stay positive and keep it as an opportunity. You know, I always say when something happens, you know, it's a plot twist, you know, it's like, <laughs> I it's love just that a plot twist, you know? Okay. So we're going to go with it. And I think as stressed as we all were, we held each other closely um, and relied on each other. And if one person was freaking out, then the rest of us can't freak out, you know, so kind of taking turns <laughs> having our meltdowns, but supporting each other and lifting each other up and taking control of what we could and letting go of the rest, I think was just a healthy response. Um, and finding joy in those moments. I mean, I think it was so frightening to think that any of us could get ill and we didn't know what would happen. And so finding joy in those moments of the puzzles and the games and the laughter and you know, cooking something new and everyone was making sourdough bread and crocheting. <laughs> I joy in that was really special. And I think 
I think we all had to kind of take a breath during that and reprioritize um, and realize that, no, there's very little that we can control, uh, but there's a lot we can control, you know, how we respond to things we can control. Um, and then there's when you can't, like, you got to let it go and just and just be together because there was so many, so many unknowns at that time. Yeah, exactly right. Well, as you know, my, my wife, Juliet, is a, a marriage and family therapist. And, you know, she reminds me all the time, especially during that, those really difficult times where you know, she would say, we, we, we can't control what happens, but we can control how we react to what's happening. And it's like, I mean, it's, it's, it's easier said than done when you're in the middle of a global pandemic and you have no idea what's going to happen long term. But that's it, a really good lesson in, in good times and bad times, mm-hmm. whether things are going well or not. I think that's a, a really good reminder. And a, it was it was good for me to kind of help me kind of level set and and think about and focus on the things that I can control and and everything else you can kind of give up to the universe or whatever, whatever you believe in. Right. right. Um, and just you know focus on what you can actually have an impact on. Right. And I really felt it was important to to be like, as I get older, I ask myself, who do I want to be in this moment? So if someone's ill, who do I want to be in the moment? When my my brother in law was ill and my sister needed support, who am I going to be? Am I going to do I want to be the person that that helps that is supportive um that they can rely on what kind of example do i want to be and during covid i looked at my four children who are you know adults um and i just felt like well who who do i want them who who do they i want them to see in this like who am i going to be during this and yes there are times when i would cry and get upset and be scared but i I wanted them to see that bad things can happen and you can still find joy and love and, and that it's, those are, there's a, that mom didn't fall apart. Like mom, mom had her moments, but she showed us that you can find joy in anything and that they can have good memories of me, you know, sitting there trying to crochet or learning how to paint something or cook something and sometimes epically failing, <laughs> but <laughs> laughing and, and just, you know, having that resilience. Um, I think that's important. We are the adults in the room. Even when we don't know what's happening, we have to be the adult in the room and, and say, we don't know what's happening, but we can, we, we will get through this together somehow. So. No, I agree. Yeah. So, and so and to that point, then, are there things that you do differently today, you know, having gone through COVID that you didn't do pre-COVID in terms of your own coping when you have a rough day or you have a parent that gets upset at you or a kid just refuses to talk or you just can't get through to them? Do you have different, you know, um, coping mechanisms or things that you do, mantras, whatever, um, that you didn't have pre-COVID? I think I really got to practice <laughs> that resilience, <laughs> right? So I really I feel like I have a different perspective on life. You know, I'm diabetic, and at first it was really scary how they said that um, if you were diabetic and you get COVID, you know, I thought for sure, oh my gosh, if I get it, that's it for me. Um, and I remember trying to work through that anxiety and wondering what was going to happen. And so I I. I reprioritized really as like, well, if my time is limited, which hello, it really is limited no matter what. No matter right? who, yeah, what's going on? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so even now to your question, post COVID, our time is limited. And so we need to take advantage of the time that we have with one another. And, and when things are too fast, um, take the time to slow down and give each other permission to um to slow down and spend time with one another um it's so easy to to get caught up it was it was strange right when everything came to a a a stop you know it was like a screech like you could almost literally hear the universe going yeah stop (laughs) (laughs) um and everyone just kind of like oh all right i'm not driving anywhere i'm not going anywhere who are you people you know so I think it's really given me permission to stop and and prioritize and 
And when I talk to people that are, I can tell are going through something, you know, I feel more um, inclined to give them some grace and to listen. I think I've become a much better listener, um, just kind of quieting my own thoughts and really listening to what the other person is going through um, and giving them grace and giving myself grace. I think that's something that we as humans aren't always very good at. I think that's a hundred percent true. Exactly. Right. And, and it's, it's, sometimes it makes me feel sad that you, you see that happening again, right. Where you think, did, did these people not learn anything from COVID where they're right back into the rat race, they jump right back on that same, you know, hamster wheel, go, go, go. It's all about, you know, accumulating, you know, likes or followers or material things, whatever it is. And you think, did you not learn anything from the, again, from the global right. pandemic? Um, yeah, I agree. But again, I can't control that, right? I, I can only control how, how I react to that. And your point is well taken. I think it's a great, uh, it's, a, it's a brilliant perspective to have is, you know, who do I want to be in this moment for this person that needs X, Y, Z? Do I want to be the person to say, well, I told you so, you should have worn a mask. You should have <laughs> washed your hands more often. You shouldn't have gone to the grocery store. Do I want to be that person? Or the person that says, oh, I'm so sorry, you're, you're sick. I'm sorry, your spouse is sick, whatever it might be. What do you need? I can make you a meal. I can drop it off on your doorstep. You know, I can order DoorDash for you, whatever it is, right? Deciding in that moment what kind of person you want to be, that's what it's all about. Yeah. It's a conscious effort. It's like a decision. It's like, you know, who's, because you're, if, if, if you think about it in like the story perspective that you're in this very long novel, hopefully, right? Um, <laughs> and things that do happen to you are plot twists. I mean, you look at the characters and you're like, well, that character did not handle that well, you know? And I think that we need to think of our lives in that, in those terms. Um, who, are, who are we in the moment? What do people, I, this is wonderful woman from this, um, conference I went to recently and she said um who do, let's see what do people experience when they experience you and later we'll have to find out who that was so we can <laughs> give her credit but it's like yeah who who what do they experience when they're talking to me am I rushed am I looking for the next thing I'm going to do or the next thing I'm going to say or am I present and listening and and yeah, is it, am I making eye contact? Am I actually, am I just thinking about my next question because I'm excited right. to talk or am I actually listening to and, and absorbing and hearing what the person that I'm engaged in discussion with is actually saying, right? I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a huge difference. Well, and, and to that point, I know we've also been talking offline about, you know, some of the, ram the longer term ramifications that you're seeing among your students, right? Because they lost, you know, six months, a year, and in some cases, a couple of years of that socializing at, at a really important, very formidable time of their lives, right? Whether it's about learning to read or how to take social cues, how to interact with somebody in person and not hide behind the screen of social media. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious about your thoughts around that and how you see, how you see that, that how long that tail is going to be where you see that affecting your students. I think it's going to be a while. Um, I think we were talking recently about how some of the students were missed school, you know, when they were in second or third grade or in first grade, when they were learning how to read or learning some basic skills, you know, in early years, you're sharing and you're working how to, you know, your how to um, how to share your toys and all that stuff. <laughs> um, and then you're reading. And I think what we're seeing now is that as students progress, you can kind of see where there's those gaps are. And it's different for every student, right? Uh, we don't live in a place where there's equal opportunities for everyone, right? So for some students with, that had parents that were working, you know, shift work or were essential workers, they may have had family members helping them. Um, and some of some of them got support with school. Some of them didn't. Um, some of them, of course, had um, illness and lost people um, with COVID or, you know, around COVID or not around COVID, just for natural illnesses and things that occur during that time. They didn't have each other to the peer support that they you need right you you need your buddy at whatever age it is and we're just seeing some that it's trickling down into socialization skills knowing um boundaries knowing when to you know like the kids seem to run around a lot like they were younger than they are so we've seen some behaviors that are different um but i think mm. i think 
again, we need to slow down and give these kids the time that they need. I think it's a shame that we still think you have to be at this age, you have to be at this place. I think it should be more personal. I think if we'd removed age and let students progress as they needed to, I think we would release, release a lot of the stress that, that students feel when they compare each other. But knowing that each family had a different experience and each child had a different experience, um, we're just seeing so many, um, I don't know, it's hard to call them learning losses. I know a lot of educators don't like that term. Um, and I think they did learn a lot. I mean, they learned a lot from adults, right? They learned how you react to things. They were watching us, right? And there so are things that would that were never lot. in any textbooks at all. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. They learned a lot about life in the world during that time. Did they learn necessarily math or reading skills? Maybe not. Um, but if there were a way that we could capture that and help bring them forward, I think um, over time we will be able to. But I think right now we just have see kids that are just all over the place, depending on their experiences and the kind of support they were able to get during that time. Sure, sure. And I think, you know, we all probably agree that, you know, pre-COVID, there was already inequities out there, you know, everywhere, no matter what city or state you happen to be in. But I think it really got amplified during COVID and then coming back and seeing where everybody's new starting place is, depending upon what was happening in their household. They had to take care of siblings while their parents were working, if they were frontline workers, like you said, or someone got sick or multi-generational ho households. All those things played into effect. What so so to that point, what what are your thoughts about where we go from here? So if we're having this conversation five years from now, maybe even three years from now, right? Um, what do you think we'll be talking about? What will what will we have learned in the next few years? You know that we aren't quite aware of yet, or maybe you're just starting to see some of the early the early stages of those trends. I think we're starting to see more options for students. And I think we're really starting to see schools trying to find ways to harness what they're passionate about. So I see um, schools moving towards offering, our middle schools specifically, offering more electives, more career pathways, recognizing that students do have these interests that when we think too traditionally about education, we tend to lose sight of some of the more natural um, passions that these students have, right? Curiosities, I guess. And I'm finding that there are more schools trying to see what students are interested in. During COVID, it, I, during COVID, I realized that it was kind of like this big the Band-Aid was kind of ripped off of education. <laughs> and I really was frustrated with the fact that people thought that when schools closed, that somehow education was over, right? That somehow education is housed in this magical building and that it doesn't happen without the building. And everyone was like, well, now what do we do? And of course, there were childcare implications and all of these things. And we don't tend to think of it that way. But wow, education is childcare for a lot of people. Um, and so what I'm seeing now is uh, when I hope to see and I'm starting to see little glimpses of is really pulling the community into education so that the building does not house education, right? That the community needs to be involved in education. So you have your local business leaders involved in your local schools, finding those passions that students have and seeing how they can bring those passions into their business and start growing these young minds and then doing more internships and more um, learning or giving programs, whether you want to learn about how you can help with homeless, with community issues, maybe homelessness or food scarcity, or maybe you're interested in the businesses that are um, in your community and how can students, how can we as schools really tap into those resources so that if we're in a situation again, where they're not physically able to come to school, well, we have partnered with so many community 
people, businesses, and, and nonprofits that we can together work at how we're going to educate the children, right? Mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I just think it's, I think we have to look at other, um, I don't know, kind of just other ways that we can. Yeah, sure. Other models, other structures. Other models. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you just, you just uh, penned the uh, title of my next book is Without a Building. Because I think what, what you just <laughs> described is exactly the same thing in, in, in the business world. We all thought that work took place in a building. Right. And that's the way it's been for a hundred years. I mean, you go right. to work, you're at, you're at a certain timeline, you have a, a, a stopwatch, right? A clock and you're in this building. That's where work gets done. And it was happening a little bit, certainly before COVID, but it really, really just accelerated beyond belief, you know, as a result of COVID. And now I think a lot of leaders are realizing, okay, some work gets done in the building, certainly, but not all the work. And there's still a lot of really good work that can get, that can get done and be accomplished outside of the building or in somebody's house or in a co-working space or wherever it might be, you know? Um, so I think that's, that's a really good point that you bring up for sure. Well, and, and oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say that students, you know, we, teachers have always been like, you know, get off your phone. And, and I think absolutely they shouldn't be on, you know, social media and texting, but really the telephone is when you're on your phone, you're connected with the whole world. And I am concerned that my students sitting in a desk don't feel that connected to the world. And so of course they're reaching for those tools. And of course they're drawn to the telephone and social media and the internet because their world, especially during COVID was really tiny. But as they could turn on their computer and be part of a global, a conversation, right? So I think the whole world is available and we have to start thinking that way because the students are going to be working in that kind of environment, right? You don't sit with 40 other people or 30 other people to get your work done. You are at home or you are doing multi, you know, different tools and you're accessing different things. And, and we are so behind in teaching um, our young people those skills we are still teaching we're still working in that old you know model of you come in you sit down you do what you're told and and now that we're realizing no learning is really dynamic and it is uh you have to be engaged and interactive and you have to have grit and perseverance and you have to think outside the box and i think as we are preparing young people for the business world we have to kind of mimic what's happening and we're not we're not it's for what for whatever reason, um, we have and maybe it's because we have so many students, we can tend to fall back on what used what it used to be like. So yeah, I am that's worried. A really, that's that a really good gonna, point. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. And again, what you said, you could you could remove the word student and remove the word teacher and say the same thing about employees and CEOs. Same kind of thing. Work is done in a different way. We've got to keep them engaged and connected and excited. And, you know, they're trying to figure out their professional identities, just like your students are in middle school are trying to figure out their personal identities, who they are, what kind of person do they want to be? How do they want to show up? And, you know, in different situations as well, we're all trying to kind of kind of figure that out. Um, but I want so I want to um, kind of wrap this up by asking you. So, you you know, that obviously the, the title of the podcast in my book is The Practical Optimist. And I I get those two different you know characteristics from my from my parents, practical side from my mom, optimistic from my dad. Um, but I'm curious about kind of as you are thinking about helping to to create or craft or or uh, impact the identities of your students. What what is your identity? So what do you use? How would you describe yourself? So in thinking about this, I came up with um, after spending some time thinking about it, I came up with the principled peacemaker. I was the second of four girls. And so I was always oh, my youngest sister is 12 years younger than I am. And so she really came along. We were all like more like her aunts at that point. But uh, with the older three, I was in the middle and I always was trying to make peace. And now as I've gotten older, I still want to make peace. But so I'm always trying to bring two people together. I'm always the first one to go. Mm, we don't know the whole picture before we jump to any uh, conclusions. Let's find out more. So I really am trying to uh, hone in on on individual perspectives and not assume that I know where why someone thinks 
the way they think, right? So I'm I'm rarely going to go from A to Z, right? So if you say something, I'm not going to assume this based on that. Um, so I like peace, but then the principled part comes in with like, okay, if I have gotten to know you and uh, and I have kind of gotten to the core of the issue and I've reached out and we're trying to understand each other as a teacher, as a leader, as a friend, as a mom, whatever, there'll be a point where I'm like, okay, I hear where you're coming from, but there's all of this information that counters uh, or that you might want to think about that may help you or may guide you into thinking a different way. And whereas I respect you and I'm not going to um, end my relationship with you for feeling X, Y, Z, I am going to stand by what I believe and I, I won't bend on that. So for me as a teacher, that's doing what, what's best for kids. Um, and uh, as a human being, it's listening to people and saying, well, I can see how your life has led you to make those decisions and how your experiences have made you feel this way. My experiences have led me in this direction. And I also have this body of knowledge or information that I use to help me understand it that I recommend to you <laughs> or that I will share <laughs> with you. But I, so I guess. Great blend. I love that blend of, of the, the principled aspect of it. And, and like you said, having this kind of code of ethics, but also code of just kind of operating procedure for yourself, right? Based on information and data and research and, and all that knowledge that you have that you amass over the years, but also then also wanting to be a peacemaker and keep things, you know, Right. calm if you can like you said before you know have people react based on how you're reacting uh and and kind of play that the middle ground there too i think it's it's a great combination i love those two well thank you so much i mean it's been a great conversation i've enjoyed every minute of i've taken notes as you've been talking actually which i don't usually do during a podcast but uh, again <laughs> it's all back to that whole point of learning and 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 coming away from an interaction with something that you didn't have before it which is what it's what, what listening and and interacting and engaging is all about. So I, I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts, your insights. Uh, it's been a great discussion today. So thank you for being here. Of course, thank you.